welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special in association with the Confederation of Indian Industry. I'm Shireen Bhan and we're coming to you live from Davos 2023. As we've been pointing out over the last 24 hours, the mood here, while it continues to be somber, the world continues to deal with many of those persistent challenges that we were even talking about in May when we were here for the summer Davos. But the feeling is that perhaps on many fronts, the worst is behind us. When we talk about India, everyone is talking about India's resilience and the question now is can the resilience turn to resurgence and that is the question we hope to answer and address with our panel here uh, this evening joining me Sanjeev Bajaj TV Narendran Rajiv Memani and Chandrajit Banerjee gentlemen appreciate you joining us here on this CNBC TV 18 special here in Davos let me start by talking to you about the global mood Sanjeev Bajaj you've been meeting with global leaders global businessmen what are they telling you are they expecting a recession a mild recession a long protracted recession what's the mood Shireen, as you know, WEF is starting just uh, today. So yes, we've met a few people. And as you started off saying, the general feeling is that the worst is over. There's always a caveat, right? Because we do live in very uncertain yes. times. But currently, it looks like the worst is over. And I believe that uh, the world is divided into three pockets. You, you have the Western world, mm. which is likely to go through a recession, hopefully a mild one. You have developing countries like China, like India, which are seeing a significant uh, resurgence. And then you have China, which is just opening up and is already starting to create some positive movement. So a combination of this should be positive going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of positive movement, China's reopening is certainly good as far as uh, steel prices are concerned. Commodity markets benefiting from that. Uh, where do you see things headed, uh, TV Narendran? Yeah, I think uh, China opening up has certainly helped commodity prices. So not just steel, if you look at copper prices, it's gone up about four or $500 in the last month. Steel prices have gone up in China. Domestic prices have gone up by about $100. So overall, we see a positive sentiment. Iron ore prices have gone up. Coal prices have gone up. Not all of it is good for the steel industry. But overall, the sentiment is changing uh, in China, certainly. And that has a huge impact in the world, uh, as you know. But do you expect these prices to be sustainable? What's the <coughs> feedback that you're getting from the market? Well, it looks like it will be sustainable uh, for some time. The only uh, uh, you know, spot of bother is, of course, Europe, where the demand is still very fragile. The U.S. is quite okay, and uh, Latin America is okay. China is looking good. India is looking great. So I think in many ways, many parts of the world are picking up uh, where it left off over the last few months. So we, we are quite positive over the next six months. Well, Rajiv Mani, you know, as uh, uh, TV pointed out, it's different stories from different parts of the world. So there is this diversity that's adding to the mix as, as well. Uh, but higher interest rates, that's a given. And that's a certainty at this point in time. Easy money, uh, no longer the era for that. That's a certainty. That's a given. What is that going to mean in terms of fund flows, in terms of m and in terms of FDI? So, uh, you're absolutely right, Shireen. Uh, if you look at four big events that happened and things that n normally drove growth in the past, so you had COVID, uh, you had uh, tapering, you had inflation, and you had geopolitical tensions that have come up. Historically, we have seen growth in the context of, uh, you know, a stable world, a low interest regime, uh, money flowing through. So, these uh, globalization, these were the big drivers for growth, for economies around the world and in particular for emerging economies like India and others. So I think we are going to see a new uh, era that is going to come through. Uh, also, I think the, the cycle, you know, as, as uh, Narendra was saying, this, the, the movement in which business is going to happen mm. will be very rapid. So I don't think we're going to see cycles of year, two years, three years. There is going to be a very rapid turnaround. And at least what I'm seeing is that those uh, and companies also, I mean, yeah, there is a lot of noise that Amazon has let go 10,000 people. Mm. But in the last two years, they've also hired 500,000 people. So, you know, so I think the, the, there was a, a, an action that happened, especially in tech companies, and now they're letting people, some people go. So it's creating this thing. So as Sanjeev rightly said, there is a <clears throat> mild recession. Companies are getting prepared. And I think if your question is in reference to India, mm. uh, I think if I have to look at it, uh, Middle East uh, and India, uh, and, and how Southeast Asia uh, plays out and China plays out are seen as the positive parts uh, of the world. So as long, I, I don't see uh, definitely, uh, you know, short-term capital will be more volatile, they'll come in, come out. 
But there are two big things that are, may happen. Mm. One is if Fed reduces. Mm. And a lot of times I think businesses are also, I, my personal view is that businesses are also talking of pressure and everything else. Because Fed has been very clear that they will wait for interest rate reduction once they see the labor supply tightening mm. up. So I think Fed rate reduction and the Ukraine war, in my view, can't go on for another year. So as these things, you know, settle down, these will be but big that pops. that was the expectation last year as so, well. Uh, yeah. We are almost at the end of our yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah, but I, it's unlikely that both countries can sustain it for another year. So I think when these things change, I have a feeling that towards the second half of this year, we will see much accelerated flows. And I think India, given the GDP growth, mm. uh, given the tax buoyancy, given the uh, macroeconomic situation, the demand and everything else, uh, I think we are in a very good position to attract good flows globally, probably more in the second half mm -hmm. than maybe in the first half. Well, you know, the sweet spot that you speak of uh, as far as India is concerned, CB, let me get you to comment on that because CI has just done uh, your usual business confidence survey and that tells you that at this point in time the signals are pointing at a high as far as business confidence is concerned. You know, the business, con uh, as you said, the business confidence uh, survey, the outlook survey, uh, in the last two years we have seen, uh, never seen the index swing to the extent that it's swung uh, quarter by quarter. So it's something like an index of 67.56, which is over and above 62, which was in the last quarter, and the highest in two years. And we went a little deeper into it. We found that uh, most of the PLI sectors, you know, uh, uh, they, there, is, uh, there is a feedback about addition, uh, adding on to capacity. And uh, the capacity utilization is still around 75% in most sectors. And the expectation of growth, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, their, the bottom line of companies, the corporate results, uh, are pretty, pretty buoyant about it. And the, uh, and the outlook, if you look at uh, the global outlook, as was said, that there is an expectant, uh, expectancy of America bouncing back by the second half of the year. China, of course, the only laggard being U.S., uh, sorry, Europe, uh, 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 being Europe. So there is a lot of optimism. The challenge only comes in export, mm. and but there is a lot of inflow coming with the interest arbitrage really going down between U.S. and India. Uh, you know, we see a lot of FIIs also come, uh, you know, portfolio investments coming in. So the outlook uh, really looks into all of this and as a feedback, and therefore a very strong sort of a feedback from Indian businesses, and so. Probably a little bit, I mean, one looks at the budget uh, much more expectedly because there are a few uh, things which can spur uh, the, this, uh, this optimism to a great extent if, uh, if the budget okay. is well so, received. So, so that gives me the segue to, to come back to you, Sanjeev, with the, with the priorities that you believe the budget needs to focus on. What are those two or three things that you hope that the budget will deliver on to try and move from resilience to resurgence? Very clearly, the first should be a continued expansion in uh, the government infrastructure funding. We have seen that this has played a very positive role the last few years. Uh, it's held our economy together, it's provided rural and urban jobs and uh, created uh, that much more domestic consumption. So we hope, like the 25% increase last year um, for public infra spending, we get to see that as well. The second is that this current period really hurts people at the lowest income mm. of society the most. And inflation has hurt them, loss of jobs has hurt them, uh, especially in the informal sector. And hence, uh, a cut in personal income tax only at the lower segment, mm. we believe will help these people stretch their rupee a little bit more. We think the PLI schemes, as uh, CB just said, have been very positive, extending that and adding a few sectors towards what we suggest is an employment-linked incentive scheme mm. for sectors like logistics, tour tourism, which uh, take a lot of people. Uh, this can again provide great fillip. So essentially, productive use of the capital for greater jobs and more consumption. I'll come to consumption in just a second, but let me get the tax man on the panel into the conversation. A cut in personal income tax at the lower end is what uh, a CII is suggesting. Oxfam has put out a report, as they usually do at this time of the year, and once again, it uh, highlights the widening inequality uh, and the gap between the, the rich and the poor. Uh, and Oxfam is suggesting that, the, at least as far as the Indian government is concerned, they should tax the rich more. Uh, Raji Mamani, that, that usually is, is the expectation around the budget. Do you believe that we're likely to see some changes there? And even on the much talked about capital gains tax, do you believe that we are going to see some move towards parity across different asset classes? Yeah. So I, you know, I think the margin, maximum marginal rate of tax in India is 43%. 
uh, in most countries in the world, uh, you know, it, it is there or thereabouts. Uh, in some countries, it probably reaches 45%, 50%. But the benefits that they enjoy uh, in terms of education, healthcare, and everything makes up for the difference. So I, I would think that uh, I, I don't anticipate, uh, you know, the government to be raising taxes. Uh, I think the tax uh, revenue collection has been quite buoyant. Uh, uh, I think India, sh you know, I think, you know, we should be doing about almost 30 trillion. Uh, so almost 16, 17 percent growth in tax, which will be equal to the nominal growth. It would have been higher, but because of the reduction in excise, yeah. the number is slightly lower. Otherwise, we should have seen tax buoyancy. And I think capital gains, in my view, is more of a simplification process. Mm. It's not so much to say that you can get more revenues here or you can get more mm. revenues there. I think the government has done a very good job till now, and compliments to them, that they have kept a very steady regime. So, you know, it is, it, you know, things haven't changed. I think the radical change that we saw was the reduction in corporate tax rates. Mm. Uh, and I think that's playing out very well. Hopefully the private investment cycle starts to validate that decision that was, that was taken. Uh, the the where I see uh, you know Shireen that biggest change where the government needs to make is really on the dispute resolution side. Mm. So simplification in terms of capital gains in TDS. You know we have 31 sections that deal with TDS. There are 36 different ways types of payments that are covered. There are rates yeah. ranging from 0.1 percent to 30 percent. Massive disputes. So I personally mm. think the one big focus area again to attract capital to make it easy yeah. for doing business is to look at simplification. There is far too much of litigation. So so how government does alternate dispute resolution or in my view even if they can't come to an easy answer mm. now doing a, a, a you know a VSV scheme. Yeah. Uh, you know, Vivaad Se Vishwa, something yeah. on those lines, I think will go because that is today the biggest issue that people are facing is that dispute, the tenure of dispute is just going longer and longer and longer. Well, you know, we've been reporting on this that this is likely to be something that the government is considering. Whether or not it comes into the budget or not, we don't know. But it certainly is something, dis uh, another scheme uh, that, uh, that takes into consideration the litigation that you speak of is certainly under consideration at this point in time, but we'll have to wait to see. You know, when we were here in May, uh, that is when the government decided to bring in export taxes. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the industry was of the view that if you really want to encourage private investment, especially in long gestation uh, sectors like steel, etc., then that was a bad idea. Now that it has been unwound, uh, what, is the, what is the situation as far as further investments are concerned, not just for steel, but what's the indication that you get on private capex? Are we finally going to see it take off? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that certainly hurt the sentiment for the steel industry, which uh, to me was ahead of everybody else in announcing capex for growth. Uh, but it's going to come back because once the demand grows and we are allowed to export. And there's no reason why India shouldn't be a big exporter of steel. You know, India has the raw materials. And why should Japan, China and Korea be exporting steel? when they don't have the iron ore and we have the raw material and we should be exporting steel, creating jobs. The second part is yes, uh, when I look at our customer segments, if you look at automotive, they are back to where they were four years back. Uh, if you look at construction, it's quite strong. Industrial buildings, a lot of investments going on in supply chains, warehousing, a lot of investments in oil and gas. So all that will trigger private sector investment. So I think uh, we are probably six months to one year away from getting private sector investment back the way it should didn't have been. We, didn't I hear all of you say that six months ago as well? Well, uh, well uh, for the steel industry, we had to take a six-month break. Yes, but, you did. Yeah. Yes, you did. But still, uh, if you look at Tata Steel, we are spending almost 10,000 crores a year on CapEx, and most of our peers are doing that as well. So the steel industry is spending that. I think chemicals was also strong. Uh, they should be coming back, and uh, I think uh, there will be a lot of investments in supply chains because a lot of money is going in there. Logistics and infrastructure is another mm. area. So I'm quite positive. Okay. Yeah. Well, speaking of positive, Sanjeev Bajaj, let's talk about the consumption story. You know, as far as uh, the banking sector was concerned and NBFCs, uh, this has been 2022 was, uh, was a great year uh, in terms of earnings as well as in terms of uh, credit growth. Do you believe that that's likely to continue at this point in time? Because that's where the market seems to have some questions Great. in trying to link valuations to performance. Yes, so I'm not an expert on the markets, but I, but I can tell you this, that uh, from FI22, if you look at banks, if you look at the stronger NBFCs, they're very well capitalized. Their loss ratios are at their lowest ever. Credit growth, if you see, has been strong now. It's in the mid to late teens. And uh, 
from everything we are seeing on the consumption side, uh, last year towards the end of last year, we saw rural consumption dip, but that started picking up again. Urban consumption is a little choppy. We see some months where it's growing strongly, other months is a little flattish. Uh, but all in all, overall, there is clear growth. And uh, hopefully with China now opening up, the supply chain disruptions will go away, which will make a very big difference as well. Uh, the government continues to support uh, people at the lower income as well. So combination of these factors should continue with stable to, I would say, growing uh, consumption um, on uh, consumer durables and other items, which should uh, keep the CAPEX cycle going. Okay, and you believe you'll be able to replicate the 22 uh, kind of numbers? Well, I wouldn't project out numbers right now for any particular company, but I would say overall from an industry perspective, uh, it does look reasonably good. Um, a lot, again, depends on external uh, the mm. situation. Mm. Uh, there are uncertainties, and this could play spoil sport. Uh, I think the first two quarters could be a little muted, but uh, of the new year, that is, uh, but thereafter should be good. Okay. CP, you know, you talked about export and the export opportunity as well. Uh, even though it is a, a challenging global macro environment, now India has restarted the process of inking CEPAs, FTAs, etc. Uh, do you believe that a further acceleration is required? Because still our share of global trade continues to be uh, significantly lower, significantly lower than our true potential. So there are two things that we talked about. Uh, you know, is of course uh, speeding speeding up the uh, you know, process of FTAs with some of the, you know, we are already in discussion with UK and probably many more. We have done some of them, which has just kicked in and it's showing positive results. The other area which we really covered up uh, uh, during the discussion, which I think has to be a big focus on, is the infrastructure mm. and, the co and the export competitiveness. And I think that's going to be uh, critical. And uh, the focus needs to be both on the ex uh, external front in terms of getting these FTAs where we can get some of our products uh, 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 and accesses into the market. The second is the infrastructure area, uh, uh, bit. And the third is, uh, you know, adoption of certain global standards, even our standards, which gets adopted globally. I think these three issues are going to be very, very critical as we focus on exports going forward. Mm -hmm. Rajiv Mamani, you know, uh, in terms of policy action, uh, one of the big things that is on the anvil and uh, we understand currently in the making is a new industrial policy. What is it that you believe uh, the government needs to be mindful of as we move towards finalization, especially when it comes to tariffs, etc.? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, this has been in the works. There was also Desh uh, that was announced. Which has not been taken forward either. Which has yeah. not been taken forward And for forward the benefit yet. of our audience, Desh is the new SEZ bill that was supposed to replace the old SEZ Act, but it was supposed to come up in this session of Parliament. It didn't yeah, make it. Yeah, so I would think that if they can, whatever they do, if they can implement that quickly, I think we have a unique opportunity right now. Uh, with supply chain shifting and, 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 you know, people looking at other opportunities. In a way, a lot of these things have been laid out. You know, the entire framework of Digital India, uh, the uh, Gati Shakti, the national logistics policy. If they can get the central state coordination better, which is what Desh was trying to achieve, you know, uh, uh, you know easing up large parcels of land uh, so that people can set up massive manufacturing facilities. I think from an industrial policy standpoint, the labor laws are still not fully implemented. A lot of these things happen which are announced by center are not implemented by the states. So honestly, I think there is, there is enough that the government has done from a legislative standpoint or announced in many cases. I think the question is if we can execute on some of these mm. things, uh, I think it will be much, uh, uh, much easier because the opportunity right now is here and now and these things do take mm. three to five years before they are fully implemented. To, I mean, I think if your question was towards tariffs, I think this is the way the world is reacting right now. I think in the medium term to long term, uh, the um, you know high tariff protection and everything else is, is a challenge. But if India has to redefine manufacturing in a way, and, and even if I look at some of the most advanced countries, even in hydrogen, mm. if you look at the new policy announcements that yeah. US has made, I mean, that's massive. That, that will ensure that you know hydrogen is not competitive in other parts of the world. So we'll have to see what happens around the world and then draft a policy. And I think the government is very cognizant mm. in whatever interactions that we have been having with them of these things. The only thing is that the phase-out plan, which I think, again, they're very conscious of, has to be there. Uh, but I think main thing, Shireen, right now is really execute on some excellent policies mm. that have been laid out so that the opportunity can be capitalized. Well, speaking of the opportunity, uh, 
TV Narendran, let me get you to comment on that. Uh, you know, whatever comes through the NCLT and your, uh, you, you, you benefited through that process as well and the expectation is that there will be some changes made to the uh, IBC uh, law as well. Uh, and asset monetization where the expectation was that we would have been able to achieve a much higher target than we have. Uh, on both those, what does India Inc. at this point in time feel want? I think uh, uh, monetizing the assets unlocking the value from these assets is certainly the right thing to do. Just look at what has happened through IBC, even for those cases. It took a long time, but where there was success, even if you look at the Bhushan plant that we acquired, yeah. when we acquired it was producing less than 3 million tons. Today it's producing more than 5 million tons. The Nilachal plant we acquired, which was closed for three years, it's already operational. So that creates economic activity. We are investing money, it creates jobs, suppliers are benefited, customers get steel. So I think there's a lot of opportunity like this lying around where there are assets with the government which can get monetized. It could be land, it could be anything. So I think there is a need to move more and more in this direction for two reasons. One is the government gets uh, revenue which it can use for other applications. And two is you get more out of assets which have been created, which are today unproductive because for whatever reasons they've not been uh, unlocking value. Mm -hmm. So let me end by, by getting uh, comments from each one of you. And Sanjeev, I want to start by asking you, uh, given the growth that is expected at this point in time uh, and you know we've seen layoffs but that's only been in select sectors largely tech ed tech and so on and so forth uh, do you see hiring uh, move to a much more gradual pace across industry um, you know in terms of uh, layoffs as well are you hearing from industry that uh, you know it's likely to be a secular move uh, what's the sense that you get at this point in time so again if you Put the tech industry on one side, because tech industry was hiring like crazy the last two years. You just couldn't get engineers. And they are the ones that are going slow. But across other sectors, especially when I look at financial services, we continue to see hiring. There is a dramatic change, at least in financial services, oh. happening because of the digitalization of financial services. Today, I know we ourselves will hire this year over three to 4,000 engineers in a financial services company and we'll probably continue doing that the next three or four years. Mm. So you're seeing a change in the composition of the workforce also in at least some of the sectors. So I believe that outside of tech, you will see hiring continue, may not be very strong, as I said, the first couple of quarters, but uh, thereafter you should see it growing. Mm -hmm. uh, Raji Mamani, uh, is it likely to be uh, a year of uh, big ticket consolidation, m and activity? Uh, do you believe that the IPO market is going to see a fair degree of momentum as well? Yeah, I mean, hard to say, but I, I think a lot of m and and consolidation uh, has happened in many industries, and I think it's something that will continue uh, as people, you know, decide how they allocate capital and what they do, whether... Uh, so I don't see any any big slowdown in that. But I do hope that outside of consolidation, now we see uh, more capital, new projects and new capital expansion, as, as Narendra mentioned, what we're seeing in steel industry and others. I think we have seen in the last three, four years, a lot of productivity gains have mm. come through these consolidation. I think now it's, uh, I think the second phase, what is more interesting to watch is how does this add to, to new capacity and everything. Do you, do you fear if we don't actually see a pickup in private capex that the concessional tax rate that was given by the government will finally see the sunset? You know, right now, uh, Shireen, there is a lot of tax buoyancy. So, you know, corporate tax rate, you know, the growths. I mean, yeah. they're growing at more yeah. than 30, 35%. Private, uh, you know, personal tax is growing at, at similar rates. But if the government does come under pressure uh, and they have to, because the because private spending in capex is not happening, mm. and if they have to reallocate capital, where they have to front end the spending, yeah. I mean, they're already doing 2.9% of GDP, but suppose they want to take it to 3.5, 3.8%. And if you have a hard line on what fiscal deficit should be, uh, then I think at some stage, I don't see that happening now, but at some stage, few years down the line, if private capex doesn't pick up, mm. then you may, you may, the government may well be justified in doing something like that. Yeah, well, that, that certainly seems to be the logic that the government is working with at this point in time. TV Narendran, we're here in Davos, uh, and the message for, that the Indian government is sending out is, look, India is open, it's open for business, uh, we're rolling out the red carpet for whoever wants to invest at, at, at this point in time. Uh, any sectors in specific where you believe that we're likely to see most interest? I think certainly, uh, if you look at global organizations, it's very clear that uh, everyone is looking at an alternate to China. Uh, and India is certainly an uh, attractive uh, destination because India is not just a source but can be a market. So I think it's better than many other options that you have when you look beyond China. 
what I'm hearing generally from global companies is make in China for China mm. and make somewhere else for the rest of the world. So I think that's a great opportunity for India. Electronics manufacturing is a great story, I think, over the last two, three years. Uh, and I think uh, more and more sectors. And I think, as Sanjeev said, we probably need to focus a little bit more. While semiconductors is great, uh, it's uh, uh, you know important from a strategic point of view, but it's capital intensive. You need yeah. more and more skill intensive or job intensive sectors as well. But I'm very positive over the options for India. Well, CB, I'll give you the final say uh, as we close out this panel here in Davos. Uh, uh, you know, the, the message that Indian industry is sending out to the global industry as well. So, you know, this is a huge year of opportunity for us. As you know, India is, the, is in the presidency of G20. And all of us are involved in the business part of the B20. Yes. And therefore, this is an opportunity which we are trying to work internally to see how the states of India, can, it becomes easier for doing business with. And we can attract global capital very strongly during the course of the year, some of the best capitals into, the, in, into India through the process uh, under the umbrella of G20. Because this is a uh, uh, year when the globe is seeing it, not only India to be the sweet spot, so to say, but also a lot of changes which are taking place uh, at, the, at the central level in terms of reforms, but that taking down to the state level where the investment actually happens and making it really happen during the course of the year is the type of message that we are trying to give in Davos. Okay, that is the message from India Inc. to global investors here in Davos. The mood across India Inc. continues to be buoyant. The hope, of course, is that the government will continue uh, to bolster uh, decisions when it comes to the ease of doing business and further reforms and the government's hope is that private sector will finally put its money where its mouth is and we will see private capex uh, uh, lift off but uh, uh, at this point in time given the global macros as well as the uncertainty the mood here in the India camp continues to be one of resilience. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here uh, on uh, this very special episode of CNBC TV 18's Global Dialogues in Davos. We are going to take a break uh, and come back with a lot more conversation. Keep watching our coverage here from Davos 2023.